First of all, thank you to everyone who uh, is staying around for the last session. Um, if you do need to leave, I will not be offended or taken amiss. Just please get up and go. Just I ask you to be quiet, that's all. All right, so this is all about documentation, the fine art of it. Um, so for those of you who may have seen this slide yesterday, you're seeing it again. And before we get started, there are two things I'd like to mention. The first is that all the slides and speakers' notes are available for download, and I'll be providing a link at the end of the talk. Uh, I tend to be one of those folks who can't keep up with the speaker and take notes at the same time. So for those folks in the same situation, there's no need to take notes. Everything I'm going to be covering is, once again, going to be available for download. The second, please hold all questions until the end. Uh, if you've got questions, make a note of them. Talk with me afterwards. Hopefully, we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, but with luck, I'll be able to answer most of your questions during the talk itself. So why document? I mean, it's a lot of work, especially if you're someone who normally doesn't write a lot. Well, one reason for me is that I like to take vacations. Here's one uh, that I took a few years ago. 90% of the time, this was my view. My glorious, beautiful, thousands of miles from anywhere view. And my internet connection was both slow and expensive, uh, which focused my priorities towards using my expensive internet time to post photos to Facebook and away from using it to check my work email. And it was possible for work to have called me on the boat, but as you can see, the cost would have likely pushed whatever problem work was having from call him right now to this can wait. <laughs> so one of the reasons why this works was that I left behind documentation covering what to do in case of emergencies as well as day-to-day -day tasks. So in fact, as, as I was riding the airport shuttle on my way to a similar trip, I got a call from my workplace where the person calling said that they'd had a power outage at our main data center. I was gone. My alternate was stuck in traffic. What should they do? I said, can you find the Mac server rack? Yes, they found it. Do you see that packet on the front marked emergency server startup and shutdown procedures? Yes, they do. OK, open that and start reading. It's going to walk you through the process. I talked with them for a few more minutes to make sure that they were OK. And then I said goodbye, and I ended the call. So without that packet attached to the front of the server rack, which I'd made sure was current the day before, I might have been trying to walk someone through the shutdown procedure for about 15 servers and 12 RAID arrays over the phone up until the moment that the flight attendant yanked my phone out of my hand because the plane needed to take off. That's why I document. So everyone's memory is fallible. Moreover, Murphy's Law practically guarantees that you're most likely to forget things when it's most important that you remember them. It's also easier to teach something to someone else when you have it well documented. Hopefully, that will uh, then save you on people asking you about the same thing repeatedly, which will conserve your time for other things, hopefully. So now that we've discussed why you should be documenting, let's discuss when you should be writing documentation. So documentation of certain processes and procedures may be required by law or by a policy at your workplace. So in those cases, you must document to make sure that you're in compliance. So check your common day-to-day -day processes to see if the available documentation covers your common situations. So for example, you generally don't need to write documentation to show someone how to print to the office printer. What may not be documented is how to set up the printer to print double-sided from the legal size tray. If you're not available, can others get the job done? So check your regular processes and procedures to see if the documentation that's available is sufficient to help others get them done in the event that you're not there. After all, even if you get hit by the lottery bus, the job still needs to get done. And documentation also allows you a way to communicate how to properly handle unusual situations. Now, you may be able to assume that your coworkers know to hold down the N key on new machines' keyboards in order to netboot a machine from your work's default netboot set. However, do they know how to handle that new MacBook Pro that isn't booting up? Probably not, unless you've also documented how they should be using this new non-default netboot set that you've built to support the new laptops that are coming in. So disaster recovery documentation may fit under documentation that you're required to do. If it isn't, you should certainly still be doing it as business continuity documentation. Disasters happen regardless if you are in or out of the office. And your disaster recovery plan should also not consist of this. Now, if there is ever a time to get all the details uh, included in your documentation, this time is it. This is something I, I want to cover more in depth, so I'll be coming back to this later in the talk. So once you've done your assessment, it should be relatively straightforward to find where your documentation has gaps. 
And when you find those gaps in your documentation, fill them. So who is the audience for your documentation? Usually this can be broken down into three main groups. There's you, there's your colleagues, and then there's everybody else. So the documentation you write for your own use is first and foremost a memory aid. Now this kind of documentation can take all kinds of forms, from notes typed into a notebook app, email sent to yourself, or information posted to a wiki, whatever works best for you. Now in my opinion, this is the only time when you can make assumptions about the knowledge level of your audience. But even there, we all have off days. Now the other thing to keep in mind is that the documentation that you write for yourself should have sufficient detail that you can turn it uh, into documentation for other folks fairly easily. So in writing documentation for your colleagues, in my opinion, you want to tell them the story of the problem, how that problem was discovered, the implications of that problem, the process you followed when solving the problem. If appropriate, include where you initially took an incorrect approach and how you recognized and you fixed that. And finally, how you solved the problem. So add all the details you can into this documentation, including the commented code if a script is included. So as an example of that, uh, a few years ago, I had uh, a user in my office who was still running 10.8.5, and he needed to have uh, an interview with someone over Skype. And we downloaded the latest version of Skype, and then this appeared. You can't use Skype, because you've got 10.8.5. Um, so turned out that that version of Skype only supported 10.9 and later, which was not something that they mentioned on Skype's system requirements. <laughs> in fact, the only way, place you found that was with this, uh, this uh, JavaScript whatever pop-up that appeared over the download page, which I had to get a, a screenshot of the whole thing, otherwise I couldn't have even gotten you know, just, just that section. Um, and so showed where, described what the problem was, showed where I found the solution, um, and also made sure to say, you know, for those who still do need that version of Skype that works for uh, 10.8, uh, what version of Skype is still able to handle that and where you can get it from. And of course, last but not least, I included a, uh, some recognition of my colleague who I discussed this problem with who helped me find this solution. Another issue that came up was that uh, one of my users at work, uh, he's one of our developers, he has a Linux box. Um, he has his, uh, home, his uh, account mounted under slash home, and he wanted to see if he could replicate the same thing for his Mac so that his scripts that he had that were accessing his home folder were going to be you know, kind of the same place. So at the time, I really didn't know much about slash home. I knew that uh, nothing was in it. I knew that it was listed in Etsy Automaster, and I knew the time machine didn't back it up for whatever reason. So after some research and talking with Apple Enterprise support, um, I discovered uh, some information about slash home and what it does. And my user had wanted to mount it via SMB. Um, so I found out you know, how you do that with SMB and have it mount automatically under you know, slash home, and also a fun little curl queue about the password rules. Because if you didn't have a password that met these rules, it would just fail silently and not tell you why. And also, why this wasn't a great idea. Um, because your password is stored in the clear, and it's in a, uh, basically a plain text file that anyone on your machine can access, you know, if you're going to do this, maybe do this via NFS or some other means. So, going through the problem, discussing what's going on, here's the solution, here's why the solution may not be the best thing to do. And, you know. and also, of course, for folks who want to know more about this kind of thing, pointing them to additional information if they're still curious. So the idea in this case is not just to tell your colleagues how to solve the problem, but also to show them how it got solved. Because after all, if you can teach them to fish, maybe they can start catching some fish of their own. Even better, maybe they'll start catching better fish than you and sharing it. And also, one thing I hear again and again is, why should I document this? Nobody's going to read this except for me. When I hear that, I know of at least one person who's going to be reading that, and that's you. So treat your future self right. Make sure to document the process that you are following, because walking through that process may help you get back into the mindset that you were in when you wrote the documentation in the first place. Now, for those of you who are wondering if this approach works, I've been trying to use this approach whenever possible for the past few years on my blog. So for those folks uh, who read my blog in the audience, can I get a show of hands if you think this is working? 
Okay, that's good. So when writing documentation for outside your circle of colleagues, any assumptions you may have been making about uh, knowledge level should be immediately discarded. Instead, my opinion is that you should focus on helping the reader figure out if the problem you're covering in the documentation applies to them. And if it does, provide a step-by-step -step solution to fix the problem that they're having. Now, if appropriate, include the story of the problem in the documentation. Now, however, that information should go in its own section following the solution. Because that way, the user doesn't have to read through it if they don't want to. In a case like this, I think it would be nice if the user received education along the way, but the ultimate goal is to get the user back up and working as quickly as possible. So an example of that, uh, this was a bizarre thing that uh, I wound up putting into my knowledge base. Um, the problem is I'm unable to find my user's folder on the hard drive. How can I fix this? And then I walk them through a seemingly bizarre way to fix this problem. So please install iTunes 11.2.1 or later to fix this issue. Um, tell them where it's available from. If for whatever reason you can't update to 11.2.1, you need to go into System Preferences, open the iCloud Preference pane, find out if Find My Mac's enabled, uncheck that, then uh, download and run the installer package link below, which uh, does various things. Uh, warns them that this may take a few minutes to run, and then reboot. And then after the reboot, verify that you can see the user's folder. So I haven't really explained anything about what happened, because that goes afterwards. So for those folks who remember this fun problem, iTunes 11.2 had this fun issue, which was tied to Find My Mac, that when you installed it, um, it, hid the user, you know, it hid the user's folder, and it also made that top level world writable. So the installer package was basically to fix the permissions and unhide users and uh, you know, just basically fix everything else. And I also made sure to note that it's important that Find My Mac be disabled before you run the permissions fix and that it remain disabled if you can't update to iTunes 11.2.1. This was a bizarre problem. Uh, another example has to do with the local items keychain. So the problem here is, you know, I'm getting repeatedly prompted to unlock the local items keychain in multiple applications. How can I resolve this? And I make sure to include a screenshot of what they're looking at. And I also have this little note at the bottom. This article is about the local items keychain, not the login keychain. If your problem is with the login keychain, click this link. So then I walk them through the process of how to go through and toss the, key and toss the, uh, the folder for local items keychain, because of course there's no folder named local items keychain. And I also make a note that they need to restart their Mac, and that after the restart, they're going to see another folder named similarly pop up in that location, and that's okay. So at this point, we've discussed why you should be documenting, the styles you may want to use when you're addressing your different audiences. So now let's turn to how you can do this in your own job. So how to do it breaks down for me into four main areas. There's the process you use to write documentation, the tools that you're using, genericizing, and the media that you're using. So process is probably where everybody's gonna do things their own way. Um, for myself, my process of writing documentation involves getting the details down first and screenshotting absolutely every step that I can. So the screenshots I'm getting sometimes aren't what go into the final documentation, but they are invaluable to me if I need to recreate something later. So in my process, the overriding initial priority is getting that raw data. It may turn out that I don't need something even at, you know, after I have it, but I'd rather have it and not need it than the reverse. And without the details, all the polishing and wordsmithing in the world will not make your documentation better, so make sure you get those first. My usual process begins like this, by creating a folder where I'm gonna store everything related to a particular piece of documentation. Next, I'll do a dump of all the relevant information into a document, what the documentation will likely be titled, the various components, links to those components, any and all important details that I can gather. And as mentioned, part of my process is screenshotting as much as I can. So for this, I rely on OS X's built-in capabilities to take uh, screenshots via keyboard shortcuts. So more often than not, I'm using Command Shift 4 and then clicking on the space bar to get a camera icon. So once I have the camera icon, I can move it onto a window that I want to get a screenshot of and then click on the window to make that screenshot. 
So if you prefer to save to directly to the clipboard instead, you can add the control key to the keyboard shortcut sequence. And one advantage of this method is that saving screenshots to the, keyboard, to the clipboard will allow you then to paste directly into a new document. So by default, when you take a screenshot of a window with Command, Shift, 4, Spacebar, a drop shadow is added to the image. However, you can turn this drop shadow on and off, or off as you need to. And my own preference is to have the drop shadow off. I just think it looks nicer. So to turn the drop shadow on and off, you can use the default command in Terminal to edit the screen capture settings for the drop shadow. In fact, you can use OS X's default commands to make a number of changes to how screen uh, capture files are saved. So once you've made the changes to the screen capture settings using the default command, you'll need to restart the system UE server process, which is the part of the OS responsible for doing things like taking screenshots and drawing drop shadows. So to do this, you'd run the kill all system UE server command shown on the screen, and you're running it as the logged in user, you're not running it with root privileges. So this will cause the system UE server uh, process to restart, and then it'll pick up the new screensaver settings. Not screensaver, screenshot settings, pardon me. Now for those who wanna capture screenshots via the command line, OS X also includes a screen capture command line tool. Now the options for that are shown on the screen. Now for those in the audience who can't read this, this may be a good time to remind you all that this is gonna be available for download later. So one particular thing that I always find funny is that this particular man page has a bug report right in the documentation saying that better documentation is necessary. And uh, meanwhile, as proof that merely wishing for better documentation doesn't make it so, this bug report is apparently still open over 10 years later. So when it comes to writing documentation, you'll need at the very minimum a text editor. You may also wanna use a graphics editor and a video editor. All these needs have a variety of tools available, and I'm not gonna tell you which ones to use because everyone has different tools that they like, and some people feel really strongly about what is the right tool to use. So I'm just not gonna tell you which ones to use. Instead, I'm gonna tell you which ones that I use and let you make your own judgments. So here are the tools that I use. For text editing, I'm normally using Apple's text edit or Barebones software's text wrangler. Uh, for my graphics editing, I normally just use Apple's preview as it has a surprising number of options when it comes to editing images. And when I'm shooting video, I use an application called Screeny that I purchased from the App Store to take screen capture videos and then I use Apple's QuickTime Pro to edit them. So preview in particular has been an indispensable tool for me. Now while most folks don't use it for more than viewing PDFs and images, it's also got a lot of options, like I mentioned, for editing and refining images as well. So to access its versatile array of tools, uh, open a screenshot file and then click on the Edit Toolbar button, which has a toolbox icon in El Capitan. Among its various tools is the ability to crop images to remove unwanted details from a screenshot. The Instant Alpha tool in Preview can be used to remove unwanted backgrounds. Preview can also edit images to add things like shapes and text. And this really only scratches the surface of how useful Preview has been to me when it comes to editing screenshots. So for a more in-depth tutorial, I really encourage you to check out the link on the screen. So another tool that I've come to rely on is Screeny, and this is a simple use application for creating screen capture videos. And among the reasons I like it is that it records to uh, QuickTime movie files, it has simple controls, and allows me to select how much of the screen that I want to record. So this has been especially useful to me because it allows me to record what's happening in a virtual machine and keep a tight focus on just the parts that I want to record. And now as an added bonus, since I bought it via the App Store, it's also easy for me to install it wherever I need it. And another important part of my documentation process is what I call genericizing. Now this is the fine art of removing as much specific identifying information from your documentation as possible, while hopefully still making it clear what you're talking about. So a good example of this is creating a user account that's named username and having the computer be named computer name. And one other thing I like to do when genericizing is to remove path names in the event that a directory path that I'm talking to in the documentation uh, will be different for everyone. So a good example of this is when referring to a directory path that will likely include the uh, person's username. So instead I'll replace the actual path with path two. Now when writing the documentation, it's often useful to have an actual directory structure corresponding to that, so I will often create a, path, a folder out of the root called path and then put a folder inside that called two. 
Now, the reason I do this is twofold, and it's to accommodate two different groups of people. Uh, folks who are experienced with computers should be able to look at that directory structure and just automatically substitute whatever values that uh, they need to. Um, folks who are not experienced with computers, but they do blindly follow directions that they find on the internet, uh, will get file not found errors instead of potentially breaking their machines. I've gotten a couple emails like that. Now, another method I've developed is to name things for their expected result. So a good example of that is the screenshot I took for a tool I developed called First Boot Package Install. Now, in this case, I was documenting that I'd added error logging uh, to display information on installations that had failed. So to help demonstrate the new logging, I built two new payload-free package installers. Uh, the first was named Failed Install, and it had a deliberate problem with it to make sure that the installer tool would report a failure. And the other one was named Successful Install, and it was designed to work just fine. So when I went to make the screenshot, Failed Install showed an installation failure, and Successful Install showed that everything worked great. So all this genericizing is generally a lot of work to do in advance, so I've been leveraging automation for this whenever possible. So I'm now using automated deployment tools like uh, Deploy Studio with virtual machines to quickly spin up a ready-to-go machine with the usernames, computer name, and other settings that I want to make the screenshots and screen capture videos I want when I need them. And last but not least, documentation has to be posted somewhere, but hopefully not in this fashion. <laughs> so as with creating documentation, there are a number of tools used to post electronic documentation. So once again, I'm not gonna tell folks what to use, but in my own shop, I'm using a Confluence Wiki and a SharePoint site to host internal documentation. Uh, my blog is hosted up on wordpress.com, so of course I'm using WordPress there. So in those instances where I'm not posting to either a Wiki or a blog or SharePoint, uh, my usual tool is to use Microsoft Word to write and format it, and then use OS X's built-in PDF uh, creation tool to create a PDF of it. That way I have the documentation that I wrote in both Word and PDF format. So in the last case where I'm writing it up in Word, why am I also making a PDF? Well, the reason is twofold. Uh, first, I know that all platforms will be able to read this PDF, as PDF viewers are available for just about every modern OS. Second, because PDFs encapsulate not just text, but also the images, fonts, and formatting, I know that the person receiving the PDF will be able to read it exactly the way that I wrote it, and I have no such guarantees about someone opening it in Word. So we briefly talked about disaster recovery documentation earlier, and I, I mentioned how um, I feel it's its own special ca category of documentation that I wanted to come back to it later, uh, because it's gonna be the one where you'll need to take the greatest pains and pay the most attention to detail. So before we get rolling into this part, I wanna briefly summarize the disaster recovery story that I told you earlier. I was off-site, so was the person who normally would have stood in for me, and another person was in the hot seat. Thanks to documentation, everything turned out fine, and I didn't get told to leave an airplane by the flight crew. So there are a few lessons to take from this story. Where was I when this disaster occurred? I was off-site, and I was without access to either a computer or a way to connect back to the work network. Where was the other person who had been trained on our disaster recovery process? Off-site, unavailable. Who was the person on the phone? Someone who is not trained in our disaster recovery procedures. What allowed the person on the phone to successfully bring down my servers? Accurate and easily understood documentation that was placed for ready access. What was not affected by this disaster? My vacation. Really important, that. So first thing to know about disaster recovery, this is really important. Don't panic. Stuff went wrong. Hopefully that part's over. Now's the time to take a deep breath and get it fixed. Now, one way to deal with this is to include something friendly looking on the cover page of your documentation. Now, fortunately, uh, Apple has provided an appropriate symbol that is both relevant and professional. <laughs> now, as an example of this, here's the cover sheet to some disaster recovery documentation I wrote for my previous gig. It's a subtle thing, but on a bad day, I will take all the smiles that I can get. So who's the audience for your disaster recovery documentation? I mean, you should be writing it for you or people like you, right? No. In fact, your audience may include that nice lady from facilities, that sharply dressed gentleman from HR, or the boss's niece who stopped by the office to sell some cookies. They are also going to be under pressure, and they are most assuredly going to be doing an unfamiliar task. 
You never know who's going to be standing in front of your server rack when the hammer comes down. So your disaster recovery documentation should be both comprehensive and written so that anyone can understand what needs to be done. The janitorial, accounting, or HR staff should be able to follow this and use it to shut down your servers. And don't count on the person who needs the documentation being able to access it in electronic format. So make sure hard copies of this are printed out. Remember, you have no idea ahead of time what form this disaster is going to take. Whoever is reading your documentation, they might be working in a dark room and reading with a flashlight. Don't hide this documentation. If you can, post a printed copy to the front of the server rack with a cover page or sign clearly indicating what it is and why it is there. Now, if that's not an option, put it somewhere else where it's both easily visible and clearly marked. And something that's crucial to document is your order of operations. So in order to bring up your server from being shut down, you hit the power button, right? But what all needs to happen before you hit that button? So for those not familiar with what this is, this is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, it's often portrayed in the shape of a pyramid with the largest, most fundamental needs at the bottom and the need to be fully alive or self-actualized up at the top. You have to meet your most fundamental needs before you can be fully alive. So this is Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs Disaster Recovery Edition. <laughs> so what fundamental needs must be met before you hit the power button on your server? Well, you need power. You must have the room's cooling system online and working properly. You need to have networking available. You need to have DNS available. The storage appliance that your server gets an NFS mount from needs to be online, and so on, and so on. Make sure to include this information in your documentation and specify that all of it needs to be available before your servers should be brought back up. Another thing to document is how to recover from hardware disasters as well as software ones. So document where your replacement parts are and how to replace them. Now, as part of this, make sure that the parts are labeled and readily accessible. And your server may not have a physical keyboard and mouse permanently hooked up. If you don't, make sure that there's a crash card with a keyboard, monitor, and relevant adapters, and then include how to use that card as part of your documentation. And don't assume that the person in front of your server is going to know what are the correct buttons to hit and the order to hit them in. Include this information in your disaster recovery documentation, along with graphics indicating which buttons do what and how they should be handled. And whenever possible, provide simple, easily checked ways to verify that your devices are working properly. Now, one way to do this is to take a picture of the front of individual servers when they're operating normally and use it to create a documentation with information like, you know, all these lights in the indicated area to the left should be lit up and showing green lights. Now, the third light from the left should be blinking. All the others should not be blinking. And one common event in disasters is that there is data loss. Now, oftentimes, the loss is due to file system corruption, hardware failures, or deleted or corrupt files. Now, the good news is that regular backups can turn these problems from catastrophes into inconveniences. Now, if practical, include the procedures for restoring data from your backup system as part of the disaster recovery documentation. Now, that said, this is one part of your disaster recovery process where you will want to have an IT professional handling the task. Now, assuming that this is the case, make sure you clearly indicate this in the documentation so that the non-IT folks who are reading it and following it know that they should stop at this point and get assistance. And make sure that your disaster recovery documentation is as up-to-date as it is possible to make it. But how do you know it's obsolete? Well, frankly, the best way to find out is to test it. Um, in, you know, test your disaster recovery procedures, including your backup uh, and restore procedures. So how often? I'd say at least annually, though, if possible, do it at least quarterly. And use the results of your testing to ruthlessly weed your disaster recovery documentation. The only thing that should be in it is current information, because after all, once again, the person who's reading it won't know that, oh, yeah, we retired that system three years ago. Don't even worry about that stuff. Just make sure it's up to date. Make sure it's current. And once you've identified what's obsolete, I wouldn't say throw it away. I would say just you know, move it to a legacy archiving system, because you know, documentation is relatively lightweight. It doesn't take up a whole lot of space. Save it just in case you weeded out some information that you might need again later. And as part of testing your disaster recovery procedures, identify which human-driven processes can be handled by automation and invest the time and effort needed to automate them. For example, if part of your current process includes open a terminal window and run this command, figure out how that command can be run by an automated process. 
always keep in mind that a human being other than you may be the one in the hot seat for bringing your systems down safely. And another thing that you may find as part of testing is that something got missed in the disaster recovery documentation. And a common cause is that a system was added since the last round of testing, and it just wasn't added to the documentation at that time. So whenever you find your gaps, address them as part of updating the disaster recovery documentation. And as you go through the process of documenting your disaster recovery procedures, one the other thing to keep in mind is which services can and should be moved to other systems in your organization or even to an outside cloud service. Because if you've transitioned a particular service to be handled by other systems, you've also outsourced that disaster recovery and the associated disaster recovery documentation now to the service for that other system. So that's less work for you, and it's also potentially less risk of a disaster, assuming that the other service is built on a high availability model. Now that said, there are crucial questions to ask before you move a particular service. If you don't get back answers that satisfy you, don't move that service. And finally, I would like to close with a tribute to the fictional character who first got me interested in documentation, Dr. Henry Jones Sr. Dr. Jones Sr. was exhaustively thorough when it came to documentation, and it was because he wanted to free up his brain for the Grail quest and not have to spare mental cycles to remember that St. What's-His-Name liked oatmeal instead of mutton for breakfast. Meanwhile, when Indy needed it most, Dad had made sure that all the needed details were in the Grail diary. This allowed Indy to save the day by reading the documentation as well as drawing upon his own knowledge of their shared field. So getting into the habit of documentation has helped me immensely in many ways. And being able to help others through what I've documented has been very rewarding, both professionally and personally. So if you've been in inspired to start documenting all the things, hopefully I've now equipped you with some ideas and tools that will help you to do so. And once again, the most important links you will see in this entire presentation, here is how you get it all. Uh, PDF is available from the top link, and the keynote slides are available from the bottom link. And with that, do we have any time left for Q&A? We had some time for Q&A if people right. would like to make me run around with a microphone. That's not very far to run, Aaron. So I should have run to you. Um, I'm not sure if you did even mention this in the talk, but um, I'm curious to see if you found any ways of speeding up the, the sanitization of your scripts, um, the things you post. So like, as you were saying, you just to get rid of sensitive information. Right. Um, is this a way you've, you've found to automate that? Like just to find and replace or anything like uh, that? Yeah, find and replace is often the way that I do it. And sometimes what I'll be doing is when I'm writing up a script, I'll also you know, just kind of copy and paste, drop it into a, a new document, and then sanitize that. Mm. Um, okay. For sanitization otherwise, uh, like I mentioned, I do a lot of genericizing, mm. and that's how I make sure that uh, like internal work details don't show up uh, in my documentation that I post to my blog. Mm -hmm. And um, you were mentioning using uh, VMs for, mm -hmm. for doing your demos or, or whatever it is inside there to make your documentation in there. Is that, is that, what, you, is that what you're referring to? Um, Absolutely. In fact, yeah. let me show you an example. Okay. Awesome. Because I carry these where I go. <laughs> no, it won't want to reveal anything. So, um, so I use VMware Fusion. And as you can see, I've got several documentation VMs stood up. Actually, let me get rid of this link clone. So, delete. And what I'll do, I have templates set up. And I'll just make a new one. Create link clone. Oh, it's on the other screen. Hold, please. And when I fire this up, it's just a regular VMware VM. But when I uh, set it up and built it, come on, load. Oh. 
on my job description, I explain to people I just watch progress bars all day long. Yeah, it's, uh, it, right? I think it's a lot what we all do. Yeah. Yeah. I think the mistake, Rich, is that you're supposed to be using a MacBook Air to run, according to... Oh, yes. oh yeah. That, yeah, that, that, that was clearly, <laughs> that's clearly my mistake. <laughs> I should have been using the Air. The Air would go much faster. Yes. And I'm assuming once it boots, it's going to be provisioned in a manner that... Yes, will help. This, this is all going to be provisioned and ready to go. So I And is there a open source product that you could plug at this point in time that, 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 you, that you could mention um, that you use to provision this v, these videos? Yes, uh, there is a create user package, helps me uh, with setting up the users for this. Uh, that tool is made by Per Olofsson, otherwise known as Maker Valp. Um, also, MC Extra Profile by Tim Sutton, uh, because I have local profiles installed on, on the machine, as I will be able to show you shortly. So I'm going to just log in as username because that is a perfectly valid user on this machine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> There's some movie magic going on in my videos. I, I, I frankly admit it. So for example, uh, if we go into <laughs> system preferences, Man, I take all the things that just take a long time. <laughs> uh, so if you go into system preferences and you go into users and groups, um, okay. that's my user that I'm logged in with. I have another user called administrator. I have another user called other user. Mm -hmm. And that way, if I need to show, like for example, I'm transferring something from username to this other user, mm -hmm. I have a user that's already named after that. Um, for my profiles, I've got several profiles set up. Mm -hmm. uh, using MC Extra Profile. Yep. Let me see if I can find one in particular. Where is it? Oh, there we go, screen capture. So I have a profile, for example, that disables the drop shadow. It's just happening automatically, so my screenshots are already set up Excellent. to be taken in the way that I prefer. Um, and another thing that I do is that as part of the setup process, I have a, a payload-free package that sets up this oh, yeah. directory called path and this directory called two. Oh, and it doesn't touch a file, cold file? It uh, just does uh, mkdir-p uh, and just creates a... Oh, I, was, I, I thought at the end you'd have a, something called file name, an actual MP that, file called file name. No, I, but I can put things here and then, you know, whatever I need to reference. Because mm. it's this, always not always going to be file name. Yeah, exactly. Okay, okay. Yeah. This way I've got this empty vessel. And the last question is, how do you bundle it all together into a VM? Well, for this, um, there's a couple ways you can do it. I'm most often doing it with a Deploy Studio huh. uh, workflow. Um, however, you can also use a, a first boot package. That's actually what I've been doing, uh, because yesterday in the hotel, I needed to spin up a new uh, VM for Sierra documentation. Yes. And after all, I am not at home. I do not have access to NetBoot. But what I do have, so what I was getting at was, I was trying yep. to get you to plug your own. <laughs> your oh own yes. Tool. So you don't use Create OS X VM install. No. In this case, what I'm using is uh, let me pull up okay. the tool in question. There we go. Uh, is a script I wrote that um, I adapted from another script that Tim Sutton wrote called uh, create OS 10 install DMG, and that creates a custom OS 10 installer. And what I have for that is... I highly recommend checking that out if you don't know what that tool is. It's yeah. awesome. And what I did for that was I created... Where is that? Oh, there we go. So I created a first boot package that gets included. And then when, the when uh, basically I set up an installer disk image for Fusion, and then at first boot, it goes through and installs all the packages I need to properly set up my documentation VM. So I actually did this yesterday uh, in the hotel room. So that allowed me to have this uh, documentation for Sierra DP2 up and ready to go. Yeah, it's one of those things you have to figure out the methodology that you want, the exact environment that you want. But for those folks who uh, you know, noticed my blog posts over the past couple of days, they all had tons of screenshots. They were all set up and ready to go. I was able to take a lot of them quickly simply because I already had a VM stood up. I just needed to make a link to clone and then just start screenshotting away. Cool. 
Um, so if you work for a really large organisation and uh, you really love documentation but no one else seems to, uh, how do you convince everyone else to, to start writing crap down? Uh, that, that is a tough question. How do you change the hearts of people? Um, sometimes it's because you start getting recognition for it. Uh, I also am going to refer back to this slide. Um, you, write, you read your own documentation. Um, and sometimes that's going to be enough. It's just going to have to be enough you know, because other folks may just not want to read your documentation, may not want to write documentation. But if you are the example and people start noticing all of our knowledge base articles are written by this one person, sometimes management goes, you know what, all of our knowledge base articles are written by this one person. We should have other people start writing stuff so that, you know, just in case. Um, the way that my boss has encouraged it in my own workplace is that he gave me an award for it. Uh, he's been trying to you know, persuade folks that they also need to start writing documentation. And he's like, you know what? I'm just going to give Rich a plaque for it and recognize him at a meeting that this is a great thing that he's doing. Yeah. And uh, you know, sometimes that encourages people as well. I want that award. I want, I want that recognition. And how do you do that? You start writing documentation. So, there are, there are ways to do it, but there are some folks that are just, they're never going to do it. And the only thing I can say in that case is you're not doing it for them, you're doing it for you ultimately, more often than not. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, and just, I, I just thought I'd also point out there's um, an app by the people behind Giphy, the website, mm -hmm. um, that does uh, GIF uh, creation screenshots. It's really, really awesome. So I've been using that recently for Confluence so that just the tiny little things of like drag this here to that. Oh, yeah. It's really yeah, fantastic. Yeah, that's, that, so. that's, that's awesome. I've also started doing animated GIFs um, for, uh, let me see. I think I have one that I might be able to share. Do I? Or did I toss that? Sadly, I tossed that, but I do have another example. Um, so ironically, this is my most popular blog post ever, and it, the subject may surprise you. Uh, so when LCAP first came out, I don't know uh, if folks remember, but uh, uh, Outlook didn't like it. So as part of this post, I actually managed to just create a short animated GIF showing what the expected behavior looked like. <laughs> and it's, it's very simple, but I, you know, I showed this to people, and they got it immediately what was going on. They're like, oh, I've, I'm seeing that exact thing. So yeah, this, uh, this, this post is my most visited one. It kind of took me by surprise, because I was just like, I'm just posting this little advisory. But the comment section went insane. All these people are like, I'm having this problem. And other people going, well, I tried this. And I think in the end, it was like 200 or so. It just keeps going. And as you can see, the most recent one is from May. <laughs> so yeah. But yeah, animated GIFs. I love animated GIFs because you, if nothing else, you can put them right on a, on a web page, and they work. You don't have to worry about embedding video or anything. And, and Jiffy's a good one for that. Uh, there's another app on the App Store, I think, called GIFME. Uh, same idea. You can import like a, a video into it, and it spits out an animated GIF at the end. It's good stuff. OK, we've probably got time for one more question, if there is any more. Otherwise, uh, no? All right, well, I'd like to ask you all to thank Rich for another great talk. Thank you.